everyone, we're playing today from Thunder Robotics Network. I'm Bob Haas, and with me here is Team 17861 CSH. They are the only undefeated team in qualifications at your 2024-2025 into the Deep PC World Championship. Absolutely fantastic, super awesome team. Can't wait to jump into it on Behind the Bat. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interests, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. Judica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels now available in several different color options to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allow for positioning at multiple angles. Teams in the U.S., you can request a free sample, apply for team grants, and register for 25% off at studica.com slash robots. So guys, I guess first question for you, we've seen a lot of different designs obviously coming out of Romania, you have to have one of the top designs. I know you pivoted a little bit from sample to specimen coming into Houston, why? Why? Well, uh, we uh, really liked our national sample uh, performance, but for Worlds we thought that it would be better if we were good at both, because we didn't know what would happen in qualification matches, we didn't know if our alliance partner could play specimens, so instead of focusing really heavily on samples, we decided, okay, let's make some small changes and let's be good at both. Awesome, yeah. Now, jumping into the intake right here, uh, the whole robot is very compact, but specifically, I want to say the intake is much narrower than I've seen other teams. Was this like a very intentional decision or did it just, the packaging turned out that way? Yeah, so basically, we wanted to have as much of degrees of freedom as we could, so that when we uh, enter the, the, the submersible, we could get together each and every sample that we want, like in hot tunnels. Yeah, and another question I have is, I know TDs go back and forth pretty much every season between spring, no spring, one string, two string, this and that. Yeah. So what did you guys decide and why? So we have like the Extendo, it's only powered by one string right over here. It could fit, we couldn't fit like two strings, one on this side and one on this side. Plus, it's much easier to maintain and also it's very reliable. We didn't, the string didn't broke with that one. And the, the spring was necessary, like you weren't able to run it without it? Yeah, yeah. the spring was necessary yeah, okay. to keep the tension in the string. Yeah, awesome. Now, jumping into the differentials, I'm seeing, I think, two differentials here. Is yeah, that we have two differentials. Okay, yeah. and that was just for the packaging or why go with the two differentials? So, we tested, first of all, we had the turret with one differential and it proved very reliable. The first differential was just the one, this one over here. And then when this one proved reliable, we thought, let's implement another differential. So we have a lot of degrees of movement because it is very nice and compact. So we added this differential right here to move the claw and pivot it backwards and forward. And do you have two different servos for this differential? Or, yeah, what's what's going on there? I mean, yeah, so there are both Axon Minis. This one is from a different brand, but the same servo. Is okay, okay, got it. And talking about the claw a little bit, what do you think were some of the biggest changes you made in the design to just make it super, super consistent in picking up? Yeah, so one of the most of the main changes that we did is the angle that of this clause gets extended out. So when we are in the submersible, we could play each, we could take every sample that we want. So if the claws don't open as much as we want them to, this might result in like the, not properly securing the sample when you grab it in autonomous mm -hmm. period or in teleop. Yeah. And one other thing before we jump into software, I see the red servo hub here. What has been your experience with that? I know it's new this year, so a lot of teams are going to be looking to switch to it next year. Would you recommend it? Any tips you have for teams? Talk about it. Yeah, so we recommend actually using a servo hub. For us, it's much simplified our electrical system because you only need to run a power cable and a data cable to the servo hub. And basically, it just handles all of our data communication throughout the servos from differential and also the claw. And for example, like a, a SPM, it's not as reliable as the servo hub. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, talking about the software, uh, you know, Auto is obviously working very, very well. I think we have the limelight up here. So, what do you think has been the biggest factor in making that detection very consistent? Well, I think that the first big step is to make sure that your limelight is positioned correctly. We try to keep limelight, limelight as high and as uh, top down view as possible. Then we also uh, make sure that each step in our pipeline is thoroughly calibrated and we make sure that it works well. For example, for our masks, we use two different masks. We use a HSV color range mask and another lab color mask. And then we only take the contours 
that are in both masks. This way we can have both thresholds in both color ranges uh, bigger. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Now jumping into the transfer sequence, can we see a transfer into the claw, into the deposit, and then we'll talk about the deposit. Yeah, so uh, basically for the transfer, we actually use three types of, of transfers. Um, we actually uh, need them to uh, align their sample on the basket, to put them horizontally or vertically. Uh, we actually have to uh, intake the, the sample so that uh, when it's transferred, uh, it can go horizontally right into the, the claw so that it can be actually deposited in the, the back. In the yeah, got it. And so you said you have three different transfers. Are those are driver actuated or automatic? Yeah, they are, they are drive, driverly um, yes. changeable. So the second driver actually has his transfers on the joystick right over here. And for example, if you uh, put it in the left or right, it's a certain transfer. If you put it down, it's a certain transfer. If you put it up, it's a certain transfer. In this way, we have another... Uh, uh, we have a lot of transfers in case one doesn't work, you can just swap. And uh, depending on what we want the robot to do, we just swap the transfers. Very cool. And so, so this is like the, the transfer position you determine based on how you pick up the sample or based on how you want to deposit it? Uh, it's based on how we want to deposit the sample. Okay. So when you're trying to pack samples in very cleanly, you would go one direction and if you want to just pile on top, you'd go in a different direction. Yes, right? exactly. Okay, awesome. Now jumping into the deposit itself, we've seen box tubes here and there. I think you guys have a very clever design though. So walk us through the bearing support structure and why you guys went with this design. Yeah, so instead of uh, putting the bearings at 90 degrees angle like a lot of things, we actually put them at 45 degrees so that both sides of the bearings touch the box tube. So that the box tube is supported from all sides. We also have this servo which acts as a linkage for the box tube. And uh, that's about it. It's quite a simple design. It's on a pivoting uh, axis. Did you compare this to, like, did you prototype one where you had the bearings in the traditional configuration and they're like, no, this is too much slot? Or did you just go with this design from the beginning? We just went for this design from the beginning. Uh, the reason we did it is because this was the first idea that came to mind. And because it worked so well, we thought, okay, let's keep it. Yeah. Now, talking a little bit about specimen, you said you pivoted, so I assume all of these alignment mechanisms in the back are new. Uh, walk me through what automations you have with them and how you're using them. Yeah, so these are our specimen guides. What we do is that we slam in the wall, and what happens is that the robot pushes the specimen into the uh, wall and it centers them. Then right over here, we have an ultrasonic distance sensor that detects the specimens, and what happens is that the claw picks the specimens by the clip. And then a state machine makes them go up into the scoring position where the driver presses one button uh, when the specimen is on the bar. Yeah, and another question I have regarding specimen scoring and stuff in general is we've seen a lot of teams recently pivot to strategies where they'll try to score and pick up at the same time. How does that look like for you guys from a control perspective? Is it one driver for each thing? You're doing both things with one driver. How does that work? So basically, as as we uh, grab from the submersible uh, with the turret, we actually, the turret actually goes sideways. So we drive with the with the chassis into the human player zone, and uh, when once the the specimen is grabbed we, uh, from the back, the the turret actually leaves the sample into the human player zone, and then the the out, the outtake uh, mechanism pivots into the scoring. Uh, position uh, while we are uh, slamming into the chamber for scoring the specimen our intake actually extends while uh, uh, once we press the scoring button and then the, the turret goes into a collection position and we can collect is that collection position vision based or is it just the same position every time general? same position every time by teleopter okay control. and if you guys have like the practice data how much did that improve your cycles so uh, before we changed this outtake mechanism, we actually managed to put only around seven or eight specimens in on the high chamber. But after we implemented this uh, mechanism, we are able to put uh, almost all of them, 20 on the, on the chamber. Very cool. All right. Well, CSH, thank you guys so much. Just absolutely incredible robot. Very tough competition in Romania. You came out of there just absolutely smashed it here in Houston. We have a bunch of matches tomorrow. Can't wait to see how they go. Reporting to Fun Robotics Network, Abab Haas, and this is Team 17861 CSH. Thank you.
Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Judica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels now available in several different color options to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allow for positioning at multiple angles. Teams in the U.S., you can request a free sample, apply for team grants, and register for 25% off at studica.com slash robots. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interest, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu first.